Hello everyone, and uh, my name is Jolene Gaeljudi. I'm Exhibitions Director at MACAL, uh, the Museum of African Contemporary Art al Madeni in Marrakesh. Welcome to our first webinar, and today uh, you will be attending a conversation between um, independent journalist and former editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar, um, Rebecca Proctor, and, and uh, Amina Benbushta, multidisciplinary artist currently uh, exhibited at Macal's exhibition, Have You Seen Awards and Lately, curated by Marianne MC. Um, you will be able to ask some questions in the box below, uh, below the, your screen. Please only put the questions in the Q&A box. And if you have any other comment, you can discuss in the conversation box. So I will let Rebecca start the conversation and uh, I see you at the end. Good luck. Thanks so much, Janine, and to everyone at McCall for, for inviting me to moderate this first edition of the McCall at Home. Um, it's really, it's a really great pleasure to have, you know, to have this platform. We're all still in, in um, different states of lockdown. And, you know, as I was saying to both of you over the last few days, you know, when I was in, in, um, in Marrakesh in February for McCall's latest exhibition, Have You Seen a Horizon Lately? You know, taking its title from a song by Yoko Ono. I had no idea that I would be asked to moderate a talk, you know, on Zoom, which um, a few months later, which is, uh, which was almost, I think at that time in February, we, we didn't even realize that um, we would be doing this or that, you know, talks would be even had on these webinars or Zooms or these different platforms. And um, we didn't know that the coronavirus would, would hit us the way that it has, you know, I think, um, when I arrived in Marrakech at the end of February, and that was the penultimate trip I took before, before it was locked down in Dubai, where I'm based now, I had my temperature taken, you know, and things were starting to mount, but it wasn't yet the reality, the bleak reality that, that we found ourselves in for the month of March wasn't, it still was sort of unforeseen, you know, no one really would accept that we might be in the same situation as China, but we are. Um, and so the, the silver lining, because I believe there always is a silver lining to every situation, is that while we're not physically connected, we are, we are virtually connected. And, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to speak with Amina Benbuchta, who is, you know, an artist I've admired for so long. And at the exhibition when I was there in February, I just, I loved seeing um, her work, her multimedia installation, Eternal Retour du Désir Amoureux, Eternal Return of Desire. And it's an installation on the second floor of Macau. So when this lockdown is over, I, I do encourage everyone to go and, and visit the museum. And it includes an art deco wooden bed with a mattress replaced by 80 neon tubes. It's a very sort of surreal um, presentation. It has a, it's at once performative, you know, theatrical um, and, and playful. You know, there's sort of the serious aspect and the playful aspect of this, of this artwork. So suspending and turning above the bed on this art deco bed, like a child's mobile, are neon forms, a chair, a cloud, a heart, crinoline, and an evocative red-heeled shoes. So, you know, if you're a woman, you're obviously going to be lured by these incredible shoes um, and the color red. And accompanying the, this assemblage is a sound piece that murmurs a text about feminine desire. So Amina, as, as, we, will dis, as we will discuss, you know, feminism is a big part of, of her work as well and, and sort of exploring the hidden aspects of, of womanhood. Um, so this endearing bed scene has sort of a, has a very sort of serious tone and yet a playful, imaginative tone as well. And um, as, as Amina will also explain, you know, part of the second part of the work to bring it more alive, which hopefully we'll all be able to discover soon in, in, in August or September or any time this year, is that she's hoping to leave a phone, um, a phone number by the, in the installation so that spectators, uh, viewers can actually call this number and read a poem by the, a poem called The Garden of Light by Sheikh al Nafzui. And so that she'll record these poems, the, um, she'll record the, the spoken words of each, of each um, person who calls the phone, and so that there will be an interactive quality to the work, and so that this work will then, this, these sounds, these voices will then play alongside the bed. Um, so the bed, before I turn to, to Amina, because obviously this is what's going to kind of bring this conversation full circle, really is a metaphor for the artist's um, body, which is at the heart of, of this installation. And it's an exploration of both 
female fantasies and taboos in society, particularly pertaining to Morocco. And, you know, the sort of hidden world that at times, you know, as, as, as a woman, um, and I mean, not just in Morocco, but I think the last 20th century, there's been a lot of changes. Um, and so, you know, women are both strong, but also very feminine. And that's something that I think I've, I've, I've been so pulled and lured to Amina's work uh, for precisely these reasons, for these dual aspects. Um, so before we delve, you know, more into this and more into the work itself, I mean, I'd just love to know a little bit about how lockdown has been for you as an artist and parents and what are you working on? Um, are you still exploring some of the top, these topics? Yeah, bonjour, Rebecca. Well, I'm really happy to be speaking to somebody. <laughs> the lockdown has been hard at the beginning and I feel a little shy thinking of all the people looking at me at at, the, at this very moment, we've been so isolated. But uh, in the beginning, I was not supposed to be here. So I was quite shocked and I'm missing my studio very much here in Paris because I'm in an apartment, it's not my place. I don't have my, I cannot work. I don't have my assistant. I don't have uh, the craftsman I work with. Uh, I don't have any, even material to work with. So in the beginning, it was a bit gloomy, but then uh, I realized from those circumstances, very interesting things could, uh, could grow up, in fact. We had time for once, a time we never take. So it could be an endless Sunday, but it also could be the best time to think to read in this place I'm living here in Paris, there are books. So their physical presence and uh, the possibility of reading and having all this time made my days meaningful. And in the beginning, it was hard because I was sick, in fact. So mm -hmm. I, I got this famous coronavirus, not the bad, the, the bad thing, not the bad uh, form, but still I was very tired. And then after 10 days, I realized that I had a beautiful souvenir about Matisse, Matisse being sick. He was, I think, just a banker. And then he got sick for a very long time. And at that moment, his mother gave him uh, colors and papers. I mean, he was already a young man. He was not a child. So that's how he became a painter. Wow. I mean, can you imagine such an, an incredible opportunity that sickness can bring you? And I've always uh, thought that artists are, uh, are helping us, helping us reach a better reality. So it was time to get creative. Oh, so I think I'm really now starting a new work, in fact. I'm starting a new, a new work because I can, I can, I'm changing my way of working because I have nothing to work with. So I have to think of my work in small pieces that I will assem assemble later. Mm. And I'm thinking about Matisse and his window, the window of Matisse, thinking about the outside and the inside. There's this back and forth and living in isolation, you really realize what it is to be in a small space and you reconsider all those plastic values of your art. So I think in the end, artists will have many things to offer after the confinement. There will be a big change. I, I, I believe this too. You know, we, we don't, again, the thing that's been difficult, I think, for a lot of people to embrace, and we were just speaking about it, is the unknown. We still have this desire, I think, like things were before, to control things, to know exactly where we're going. Um, but this is when I think a lot of creative things happen. As you said, you know, it, I, I actually had forgotten that story about Matisse, but it's almost when you have a moment of restriction, you have a moment of confinement, and that could be psychological confinement or it could be physical confinement, that somehow the creative mind or the artist, you know, we all push against those. We have to kind of find something new to, to fill that space. And I feel that this really can be a creative time. And who knows what we'll have? I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, a museum, and they're all struggling right now, but we'll have a show on lockdown art and some of the, you know, artwork that was created during lockdown and how people use different materials or maybe a new art movement will come out of this. I think it's a time that um, will, a time that really, as you say, um, can be an experimental time. I agree totally, Rebecca, because I really believe art is an act of, of resisting, resistance. 
-hmm. And when you have such a hard thing to resist, that things are getting more and more interesting to look at and to, uh, and to work. Uh, at first, it was very difficult because I was confined and my work is all about confinement and restriction and asphyxia. So I found myself suddenly at the first degree of my work. So I, I couldn't make anything out of, out of it. Uh, it was too close to me. Then I realized slowly that I could make something new about that. So my work is going to evolve from that. My, my paintings, my, photo, my photos are all about domestic, uh, domestic spaces and how women are, uh, are caught in, the, in those spaces. Mm. So I think now I'm looking for a way to get out of those spaces. I'm going maybe to work on keyholes or uh, spaces that allow you to escape. And I mean, there will be another way for me to work my my things. I'm going to stay with my subject, of course, but in another in another way. I, I love this idea. You say your work is about confinement and, and sort of the, the metaphor of confinement for women. And perhaps that's what I loved about the bed is because it was when you get the, the, the retor, uh, return to return on desire that you showed at McCall because that bed there is, a, there is an aspect of confinement yet there, but yet there's also an aspect of freedom. So how do you play with confinement in your work? And, and is a woman still confined in your opinion? Is there still something about the woman that needs to kind of, you know, be liberated? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. We cannot make the economy of a war against the uh, patriarchy. I mean, that's still going on. I mean, uh, that has nothing, I have nothing against men. I'm talking about patriarchy. Let's be really clear about that. And my work is about confinement of the women, of course, because that's what I know about being confined by education, by uh, your role in your, uh, in your house. And we're experimenting this with the confinement. And I think men are experimenting it also, what it is to be the whole day long with children in a house and to have to deal with that and that's your life. So, of course, uh, we think things have changed, but they have not changed that much. And I like to speak about all the women that are still caught in those, in those systems. Mm -hmm. um, in my work, in this, in this idea of confinement, and I think maybe I'm going to show this because this is my crinoline, this is my, my symbol, I, I would say, of what confinement is. It may look like a corset that women were wearing for a long time. And they were, it wasn't easy to move with a crinoline, it wasn't easy to breathe. So it was like an inside prison. So it's, we're speaking about women, but more generally, it could concern any human being. And actually, we really feel close to any human being which is in isolation. And it's, it's a way to empathy. It's a way to feel this empathy. You just took the, the words out of my mouth, um, in the way to feel empathy. Do you feel this confinement um, will hopefully bring people closer together through empathy, through, through vulnerability? I'm sure. I'm sure because they're enduring it. And I've seen people that like me in the beginning, they suffered from this confinement. And slowly I realize now I'm speaking to them and they, they're discovering things that they would never have before. And many of them, I mean, I'm speaking really about close friends. One of them is learning guitar that he had I mean, he loved, but didn't never had the time to do. Another one took big decisions about his life. I mean, we all need to have to discover if ourselves are good company or not. I mean, do we like ourselves? Do we like what we're doing? Because now there's no more this agitation of the outside that uh, keeps us away from what we really want. So we personally are making a big leap because we're facing truth. But our societies too, people realize they don't need to buy so much, they don't need to go out so much, they don't need to, I mean, they, they want to take more time for themselves and for the others. I see solidarity everywhere. I see people 
uh, thinking about the others, phoning a lot, uh, speaking a lot. I mean, of course, on the screen, it's not the same that real contact, but you see people, I think, well, it's do the duality of the world. Some of them, they get worse, but you see people trying to get better in those situations. That's true. I think that, you know, we're, we're in the midst of it. It's just like, you know, an, an artistic movement. You don't really know the movement. You don't know what to call it until, until, until afterwards. So yeah. we're kind of in the midst of this, of this sort of, I don't even know what to call it, the sort of chaotic whirlwind of, of, um, Things. Excuse my cats, everybody who <laughs> just decided to jump out. Um, and, and we don't know yet, but hopefully this, I very much hope that it will bring people to closer together. I think certain countries, certain nations are dealing with it in different ways. Some people are having more of an easier time than others. But ultimately, as you said, Amina, you know, this is a time for introspection. I think artists in general, maybe, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, do have to spend a lot of time in, in self-imposed isolation to create their work. So yeah, the time alone for you is probably nothing new, if I'm not mistaken. It's not new, but uh, sometimes we're not we're not monks either. Sometimes we're not so serious about it, uh, yeah. and now we don't have the choice. So, I uh, finally I enjoy that. I must say. I mean, I know the times are a little dramatic. People are dying, and it seems we are just discovering that life is a beautiful thing that ends tragically. I mean, we're just discovering that. I mean, in our societies, at least, we're just discovering that people die. And maybe the question now is to, to ask ourselves what, what does art can do to help us deal with death as well? I mean, what is the relationship between art and death? And artists have answers maybe not answers but they have the good questions about that and we have to work on that, that. yeah so i mean i was to sort of i guess bring in sort of a new comment here from what i prepared because it just happened yesterday but i was quite distraught i mean there's been people i was quite distraught to learn that you know germano chalant who i'm sure everybody knows passed away from coronavirus i mean he was 80 and he is um mm -hmm. extremely well-known um, Italian curator who founded Arte, Arte Povera and you know of course we mourn him because we know him but there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people who are dying every day and you know it's the people that we're connected to obviously that affect us the most but there is this sense of collective mourning at the moment and since you've you know you've relayed this and brought it up I mean I mean how what is for you the connection between art and death. I mean, art is a part of life, so it must be also part of death. Yes, it, it must. I mean, I think we have, um, we have forgotten that in, in our lives, the, that there is a tragic end, but that tragic end does not mean we shouldn't be happy. It doesn't mean that life is not beautiful and art is here to bring that hope he, art is here to resist, to resist this, the idea of the death. So we, we're the, the, the creation. I mean, I will never be bored because I always have a creation to do. So whatever the tragic end, I'm happy to go through it because I'm creating. And maybe that's something we can, we can trans, transmit to people. I mean, this uh, idea of hope, whatever, mm -hmm the fear we may have of that, but the sense, the sense of life to be, to be a good human is to resist and to create. Yes. I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of research and various different, you know, from academic texts to journals about the spiritual and arts and the ability of art to transcend. I mean, not sort of without going too much into sort of metaphysics, but the idea that an artwork or a piece of music, for example, you know, I mean, when you're, or a dance, um, I used to be a dancer, and when you're really, really in the artwork, I'm sure you've had these experiences, I mean, and when you're really into creating that artwork, you're really dancing, really listening to the music, or just fully in your work, you do in some ways sort of transcend the moment. You know, you're sort of at one with something that's greater than you. I mean, I, I, do, I do believe that, and art has that, a, ability a really great piece of work um that sort of you know it attracts us uh physically but also intellectually mm -hmm. has the ability to allow human beings to individually and collectively transcend 
whatever is happening in the status quo. Yes, art really helps transcend the pain. It's not going to change the reality, but it helps you transcend the pain and get over it in some ways. And I guess that's the question before I, we kind of delve a bit more into the, the themes inherent in your work and particularly the most recent work that I saw. The challenge I think a lot of artists are facing, and I'd love to know what you think, is we have now this digital platform we have to communicate with, we have to share with, we have to show work with screens. Um, and we don't know this will last for some time um, because of our current situation. How do you feel about that? Do you, there's obviously something that's lost in the translation of an image or a text or a, you know, a piece of art when you have it translated through these screens. What do you feel about sort of the digital landscape that we operate in at the moment? Well, personally, I have, uh, no, I have a hard time with it. I have a hard time, but um, still it's the screen, it's a window to something and it's a way to share. So I'm using it. I'm, I'm really happy today to be speaking with you. And I know behind you are other people. So, but I need to be drawing paint. I need to be, um, I, I want to do sculpture, installations. I want to do things that I can touch with my hand. It's very important for me. And I, I suffer very much from, from the situation because of that, because of the, the lack of reality. But maybe it's a question of generation. I mean, younger artists that work only with digital uh, tools would have a different answer, of course. It's true. I, I, I think it's an answer that's, per, that's a question that's perplexing a lot of people because as human beings, there is, we can't just um, live in the digital realm. Uh, we, we, I mean, be, of course, our younger generations, the millennials or the X or the Y generations, whatever you call them, I mean, they do sort of really kind of, you know, partake in the screen culture, but there still is this connection between human beings, the connection between, you know, physicality, the spirit. There's nothing that can replace, as you said, throwing the paint or you know, being next to your artwork. I, I don't feel, I even don't remember the artwork the same mm -hmm. if I'm seeing um, it on a screen versus, you know, standing there, feeling it, listening to it. Um, but at the moment we have this platform, we have what we have. And so it's sort of the sort of temporary yet also, um, you know, long-term platform. We, I think people are kind of adjusting in my, I mean, I don't know. I mean, an artist might see it differently, but adjusting in terms of how to use the digital with the physical after this because we'll kind of be in this this weird you know realm for a while i think i know i know and we're, we're getting used to be confined i mean sometimes i go out and we feel weird i know and and with the mask we're not even if we're smiling people don't see you're smiling at them yeah. so we feel a little bizarre i mean uh, but i'm sure we'll go back to it really quickly what I'm most afraid of is um, if we get used to this, only screens, I mean, do we really want a world like that? I mean, I don't, I don't want a world like that, but uh, there is this motion now that makes us more and more living behind our screens. And now they really got us stuck in a form that we have no other choice. And what is there going to be after that? Are we going to find the freedom we had? I mean, I'm a little bit afraid of all these questions, to say the truth. I mean, we, I feel like we've been trapped. Well, I, a lot of people agree with you. I was watching, um, in preparation for another talk last week, the Vogue Global Conversations, and Mark Jacobs, he was quite bold and just incredibly honest and candid. And he just said, the scariest part of this lockdown is that it is sort of reinforcing the, the, the digital race that's already been in place. Um, and he said that's already been, become very scary for him as a designer or as any sort of creative because there was a problem with the whole digital sphere. You know, it's it, now we're just completely, we have no choice but to partake in it. So we don't know yet the new system. We don't know yet how this will be. And we sort of, as we start off with this talk, we have to make peace with the unknown. And, and that's hard for human beings. It's really, it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to accept that we really only have this moment. We just don't know what will happen. 
And that's been, I think, really the uh, psychologically for everybody, it's been, I think, probably the toughest part of this, uh, including uh, confinement, yeah. But what I wanted to, to add to this point is like it, before the corona, you could only hear speeches about, oh, it's going to be the end of the world as we know it, the economy is so bad, the, the gilets jaunes in France, the problems, the, but after the corona, I see people are trying already to build another world because they've realized so much uh, how our economies um, bring damages to the world. They realize how the social inequalities and the globalization, I mean, so many things are, are coming up people are really aware that the world has to change. And so the speeches, the ideas have changed. Now people are talking about creating a new world. So I don't think this is so bad finally, because maybe this shock, maybe this shock will create something new. And I'm sure artists will accompany that. No, definitely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the artists are, I like to think that they take the pulse of a society, they're the zeitgeist of the society, you know, you, and after this time is over, well, after we've all perished from Corona <laughs> or not, um, what's left is the artwork, you know, I mean, unless it's everything gets destroyed, you understand a time and a people and a civilization from the artwork, people will see, and that's what, you know, people will see your art. Um, and Amina, as you were saying, there is a relationship between art and death because mm -hmm. the art does transcend life. It's something that you've created unless, matter becomes extinct or whatever but i and i think that's a powerful idea what we create in this time will will hopefully you know outlive us um and offer something to to the people that live after us um, I'm, on that, yeah. I'm sure of that rebecca i mean as i told you when i was uh, in this apartment and i had nothing to do in the beginning before i realized i could create in another way and well, et cetera, et cetera. But I started to read because it was the only thing I had to do. And I, I mean, my work is all about storytelling. So I'm really connected to all the old epics, the folklore, the, the child tales. Um, I mean, all of that is behind my, my work. So I reconnected. I mean, of course, I'm not reading the, um, the Aeneid <laughs> in, uh, in the book, but just the physical presence of the books and going through them. Uh, I had the Decameron of Boccaccio here. Oh, yeah. me. And of course, it's all about the great, the great pest in Florence in the 14th century. Uh, the plague. They also went through a, a pandemic, a sickness. Yeah. Well, I was really interested by the book because um, how did those people react to the plague? They reacted to it by the beauty of storytelling by the art of storytelling. And that's how they survived the, the, the plague. And after the plague, what happened? The Renaissance came. So, I mean, history is made of those uh, terrible things followed by beautiful things. Yeah. And you have to have that hope. No, definitely. And I, it's funny you mentioned Boccaccio. I wrote an article a few weeks ago about sort of the Italian sense of humor and kind of getting through, you know, Mm -hmm. what's happening i mean now i think people there's this, there's still some humor but it's kind of died down because it's just you know we're all in lockdown but even in boccaccio's the cameron at one point there's even a bit of humor as they're reading texts and sharing stories you know people are laughing and a lot of humor yeah there's a lot of humor and so there's the sort of the humor in itself is a is a form of resilience you know i think mediterranean culture is almost famous for that is that there's this sort of beauty of life no matter what is happening no matter how bad things are there's there, there is there's a beauty to be always found and um, we, we can't forget that and on that note i would love to sort of pick up you know your own storytelling in these works maybe we can start first with um you know the recent work that you showed at mccall what is the story behind that work uh the story about the work yes as you said it's a bed so it's very, uh, it's a domestic space again. It's the parents' bedroom, often, obviously. And the white light that, uh, that comes out of the bed is like the startling discovery of sexual life of, of, of your parents, because that's the big shock a child can have. Suddenly the discovery of, of sexuality. 
and the, um, the text I'm reading is from uh, Arabic erotica. I mean, the garden of the light. I mean, it's not difficult to understand what kind of garden he's talking about. It is a manual of erotology. It's, um, I mean, I like, I like this idea that Arabic is the language of sex, in fact, and it's things we have forgotten. So I love it. I love, I love to bring it back to memory. And that's why I wanted people to read the texts so they can have it their own again. They can go back to their memories, the memory of their culture that we have, uh, that we have forgotten. The, um, the story behind the bed with all the neon lights is also connected to my own personal history. And it's always interesting to see like you have uh, the intentions of art, but they have a sense only if they're connected to your own inner emotions as well. And the most, the deepest emotions that you may have are those of your childhood. I always need to remember that I am from a double culture. I'm half French, I'm half Moroccan. So I've always had to go back and forth, forth from, from one culture to another. And the beds of the 1930s really tells about like the colonization of countries when the French came slowly in, in Morocco. To, to colonize Morocco. So it was a shock of culture, a different way of thinking what a couple is. Suddenly, from the, the, the two models of civilization were confronting each other in the bed, because now you had the, the couple, which is a new idea of love. It wasn't what we really had in our, uh, in our uh, Arabic patterns. Of, uh, of the houses, you had a man and many women. I mean, it was completely different. So there was this confrontation of what love is. Mm -hmm. And it's connected to my own story, of course, because I was born from a French woman and a Moroccan man. And the neon lights as well, they tell, they tell as, as you said, it's a child mobile. So the bed is also where you're born. I mean, where a child is born. It's the place where you die as well. And it's the place where you make love. So that's all those different meanings. That's very endearing, but also very deep. I, I didn't think of the bed that way. It is the place where you, you're born, you make love, and you also die. Most, I mean, most likely you so die. Most so important. Bed. It's the place where you dream. And I like what you said about art transcends. It's a beautiful image. I love the image of art is a transcending uh, force in you. But uh, as you said, it's all about the woman's body as well, because there is a bed, there are there's a mob, the objects, shoes, uh, crinolines, a chair, but there, there isn't a body, but it's speaking about a body, but through the fact of its disappearance. And in my photos, it's the same. I'm always, uh, I mean, there's a women in the photos, but the face is hidden. So there's always the idea of a disappearance. In other. some ways with the, I, fi I find, I guess, metaphorically, but also physically in some ways that the absence almost makes the physical more present. More exactly. This and I find, oh, sorry. No, that was the idea, exactly. And I find, you know, that work was, um, I, I was about to say sexual, but I think it's more sensual when you, when you're, I mean, I, it can also be sexual when you were standing, when I was standing next to it, this, it's childlike, it's playful, it's innocent, and yet it's a bit, there's a sensual quality to it, even though we don't have a body, as you're saying. There's, you know that there was a body and there's this something that's so deeply feminine and true, I think. And um, maybe that's what I found the struggle of, of the work and, and maybe it's something that women are still working through and you have to kind of tell me as the artist who created the work, but there's still something a bit taboo about talking about the woman in the bed and, and being free, you know, and not, not being free, but just, as you're saying, this idea that, you know, the couple is in the bed and this is the t place where you dream, it's a place where you love and, and the woman's body as a landscape of that. Um, there's still something kind of secret, something almost um, taboo, faux pas, 
to, you know, and your work kind of, it gives you a taste of it, but it takes it away. It kind of goes right to the edge and then pulls us back. That's just what I feel. But don't forget in the work there is my voice. So mm -hmm. my, my voice, voice is the somehow physical presence of a body which you don't see, but you hear a voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the text itself is very important because it speaks of the women's body. And that's why I choose that particular extract of the poem because he focuses on the woman's desire. And desire is, a, is such a, a beautiful thing because it is the freedom of the individual. This is where it starts, when there is desire. And that's why my work is always, mm, it, it is the connection of two opposite things. I mean, I, I think I'm speaking about the disappearance of something and the need for that thing to reappear, the need for love. I mean, I'm speaking about how love is missing, but how love is bringing life. That's why there's a lot of red colors in my, in my work. I'm a feminist and I'm talking about the violence done to women. So everybody thinks red is there to symbolize blood and violence, but it's also there to symbolize the strength and the violence of love. And the text uh, of Sheikh al Nafzawi uh, respects the desire of women. He says, of course, it's a man talking, it's mm -hmm. not a woman, but he's speaking for them and he's saying what they want and what they don't want in the sexual act. But he's very uh, straightforward about it. And he's saying exactly what they like. And if a man doesn't act in the way they like, they have the right to say no to that man. And so I was really startled by that, but by that text. When was this text written again? 14th century. Okay. Tunisian, he's Tunisian, Sheikh Al Nafsawi. But he's well, not the only one. He's not the only one. You have uh, Ahmed Al Tifashi, you have, oh, of course, Thousand and One Night, you have so many, so many. Yeah. And in the Renaissance, too, there was that sort of exploration yeah. the individual, the body comes to the fore Before. in the Renaissance around the same time, which is interesting. But I'm really interested by the storytelling because I believe women, they, they've been erased from history and they exist only through the stories they're allowed. I mean, through the storytelling, that's the only place they're given. And that's how they create it. It's true. And I, I as you were speaking, this idea that, about a woman's desire, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. You know, just, was it just a year ago, there was this Me Too movement and feminism has taken, you know, various different forms. Um, I, I'm American, but I've lived now almost all of my life outside of um, outside of the U.S. for various reasons. But I do, yeah, I do see feminism sort of being um, reinterpreted and acted in different ways. But I, what I do feel, and as you've just mentioned, are women? Do you feel uh, it's almost like the desire of women isn't always list? It's not listened to still after all these centuries. I mean, there's you think that desire sort of still belongs to the man, you know, and, but women have their own desires. And in, in a way, through your work, you're giving them that chance to feel free with their desires, no matter what the outcome is. And that's, that desire, as you say, is freedom. It's, it's, um, it's liberating. It's about being human, isn't it? It is, but it's coming from a 14th century text. So maybe <laughs> we think we're, we're going forward, but, but not always. And I totally agree that we're still dominated by the male gaze on things, on, on our own body, on our desires, and there's going to be a lot of work to do. So I hope my work will help for that. Yeah, no, I think it helps people to dream, you know, and, um, you know, what's the, what's the quote? I can't remember right now, but it's, um, you know, it's in our dreams that reality is manifested in many ways. You know, we don't, I've been thinking a lot about that also in this lockdown in the midst of various different writings, but you know, everything starts with a thought, you know, it really helps. It starts with a thought, which starts with a dream, which starts with a desire perhaps. It's in this lockdown that you realize the importance of, the importance of dreams. Mm -hmm. You really realize that 
we are made of of dreams <laughs> as we are made of dreams um yes and what what is that yeah our little life is rounded with a sleep i forget who's um which quote that is from but it's true it's you know it's life is fleeting um and so is death um and in some ways so is the creation of art but whatever we create whatever you know your work is it is it's coming when you think about it from from nothingness from absolutely nothing from just this moment and you know that's what i i find the lockdown in some ways if we look at it in a different way and again it's there's still a little bit of guilt in me when i say this because at the right now as i'm saying this there are people who are dying in hospitals and it's dying terrible deaths um, not being able to breathe but if we try and look at the positive aspect of this um the lockdown the restrictions that have been placed can give us our sense of freedom in a way because we you know we might as you were saying as we've mentioned before earlier in the talk it's it's a it's a way to find a new a new um relationship with our life and with ourselves and with our world that's what i call resistance yeah yeah art mm -hmm. Um, and on that note, um, yes, I think on that note, the artists are more important than ever. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this as all I, you know, I get, I've written for a lot of different, I won't, at Harper's Bazaar Art, obviously, I wrote, you know, predominantly about art and culture from the Middle East and Africa and around the world and um, receiving all the newsletters um, from Artnet, Art News and everything. It's it's all, it's all very, a lot of it is quite upsetting. You know, this museum laid off these people, this didn't happen, the art market is down 76%, but we still, the art will never go away. I think we need art more than ever, but what is art's purpose? Maybe to finish this, um, we've already been speaking for quite a while, which is this wonderful conversation, but art is needed perhaps more than ever now, but why, um, Amina, for you? Is it, it's, it's a way that hopefully we can connect. Maybe we don't have the art market. Maybe people aren't buying and selling like they like they did before. But isn't that's not only that's not the only purpose of a work of art. No, it isn't. But well, I like to remind that art is about art. I mean, as Madame Bourgeois would say, art is about <laughs> art. But on the other side, art is also what makes life more important than art as well. So those two ideas. I share and I think that what art can bring to life is as you said before is hope I mean that that is priceless and I um, I know the art market is really suffering I mean they haven't created a fund I mean many many funds to try to help artists because they're not selling there are no more exhibition there but uh, I must say personally I've had people interested in my arts during this. I mean, I'm having very interesting conversations with people and I'm thinking of new works uh, more than ever. And uh, I'm having some proposals to for exhibition for when this will be over. So, I mean, I think things will still go on. I mean, we have a really hard time, but it's not the first time in history. I mean, they've had, there were worse times and more dramatic even than of course what we're living i mean we have to be strong yes it's true we have to be strong and in our strength we can find something new it's it's i, I truly do believe that you know and maybe maybe this was the time to be tested a bit if it weren't if it didn't happen now it would happen at some point um on that note, um, it's been absolutely wonderful to speak with you. I mean, it's, it's such a treat, actually. When I was told that I would be speaking with you, I was just over the moon because I just love the work so much and I've been following your work. So um, this has just been, you know, really inspiring and really wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to now open um, this up for questions. So if people can put in, if they have questions, if they can put the questions in the Q&A box and I will read the questions. I'm getting some in French and some in English. Um, so I'll read the first one. Um, merci Amina and Rebecca pour ça, I'll, I'll speak in English then. Um, can you dire cette crise sur les énergies féminines? Like what, so what, how, how do you think this crisis is affecting, if I've understood that correctly, um, how is this crisis affecting feminine energy in your opinion, Amina? Um, 
Well, I'm going back to my uh, idea of domestic spaces. So women try to escape that. I mean, they were working and now they're doing their work at home again. But I find women are having pleasure to go back to some cooking, to go back to having time as well in their, in their, in their homes. I mean, in the good cases, of course, I'm not talking about people that are in the isolation or don't have any intimacy because of certain situation, of course. But um, suddenly they find again their place in their homes. It's an important thing also because uh, a woman wants to be free, but uh, still she has um, a, other roles and that she likes as well to be a woman, to be a mother, to to, to enjoy her, her home. So I don't know how to answer that more. Um, the next one is, do you consider yourself, um, I guess, a feminist engagé? Do you consider yourself to be a sort of, I guess I've understood the active feminist? Um, yes, I do. I love to, I love to yell that. I, I love to, to say I'm a feminist. I love it. I don't want my art to be only around that question because uh, when the political takes too much importance, sometimes the art suffers from that. But uh, I can use that. I mean, I can use my role as an artist to speak for feminism. And it's so important to remember all the women artists that have been totally forgotten from the art scene. So I want to speak for them. I feel, I feel that asphyxia and the idea of confinement in my work is, um, I mean, suffers from that. I feel the asphyxia. I feel how women have been restrained in history. So, of course, I, I love to say I'm a feminist. Um, is there is there a woman in particular that that greatly inspired you or inspires you? I guess I guess we could say historical and present day that you just really love. <laughs> of course, there's Louise Bourgeois, which is just wonderful uh, in every sense of the term, and she's giving us hope because uh, at seventy she was really famous, <laughs> so. It gives us a lot. It gives it gives a, a lot of hope, and Christine de Pizan because she was a, a Renaissance writer who who was a feminist already. I mean, there are so many of them. But as I said, women have been so much erased from history. We have to change the whole uh, writing of history. Mm. Yes, it's true. There still has work to be done on that line, and. I'm just looking at the other ones. Does anyone else have any questions? I mean, what, what is, when you can finally go out, well, I mean, I'm, I presume you're already going out to go to the grocery store and stuff. What is one thing that you're missing most about? Um, one thing that you're really desiring to do? I mean, if you could do anything outside, it could be walking in a park, it could be taking a plane, it could be swimming, I don't know. No, I just want to meet people, to have dinner with a lot of people and drink and eat with people and dre dress decently also. <laughs> we all want to put on nice clothes and be women again. And yeah. Fancy and wear nice clothes and shoes. And I would, and love, shoes. I would love that. Great. I think I, think I have all the questions, um, unless anyone else has anything else, has anything to add. Um, do you have anything to add, Amina? Or... Well, I think we, we said a lot already. Yeah, we did. Well, it's been um, a, a really great pleasure, honestly. It's been such a treat to, to speak with you and, and I can't wait, um, yeah, to see the work again in person. I, I still watch the video that I took with the whispers and the bed and it just um there's something very intimate you know i think the viewer you really managed to pull the viewer into the work and and in some ways i think as a as a woman it sort of it makes you find part of yourself again you feel whole when you go to that work i'm speaking from my own personal experience but yeah. it makes you feel free and whole 
thank you. Well, intimacy is a value, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, wonderful. I'm gonna let Jeanine um, do the final sort of wrap up. Um, we're really, really grateful to everyone who has come today. We, we tried to do this a few days ago and you know, there was a connection problem on, on Instagram Live, so we're doing it now on Zoom and it's worked out beautifully and very smoothly, which I'm so grateful for. So thank you to everyone who has um, come and yeah, and I just, it's been great to speak with, with you and thank you to McCall for, um, for this opportunity. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Marianne EMC also for the wonderful exhibition and the title was really clever, knowing what's coming, I mean, what, what, what is going on now. And thank you, Janine. Thank you very much, uh, Amina. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, it was a very inspiring conversation. And thank you, um, Amina, for this insightful and uh, deep two into your universe. And I thank everyone uh, who managed to, uh, to attend this first panel. Uh, make sure to join us next week on Thursday as well at the same time, 4 p.m. Marrakesh time and 6 p.m. Uh, CET time, as we'll be having uh, another webinar with the artist features in this exhibition. And uh, do not hesitate to follow Michael on Instagram and Facebook to have our daily, um, uh, our daily news and our uh, weekly uh, programming. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And stay safe. Be well. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So Goodbye. Bye. 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 B